All right, uh, so we're letting the letting folks into the webinar now. All right, I mean, just, you know, let me, just, my questions are all over the place. All right. all right. Welcome everyone to Powerhouse Arena's virtual events. Uh, my name is Chris and tonight we are very pleased to be hosting the launch of Image Control by Patrick Nathan. Uh, he'll be in conversation with Marlon James. Uh, you can buy copies of the book at powerhousebookstores.com. Uh, the link should be on the event page and uh, post it in the chat too. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll take your questions towards the end of the event and I'll introduce uh, them now. Marlon James was born in Jamaica in 1970. His most recent novel, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, the first novel in the Dark Star Trilogy, was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award. His previous novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, was the winner of the 2015 Man Booker Prize. He's also the author of the novels, John Crow's Devil and The Book of Night Woman. Patrick Nathan is the author of Some Hell, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. His short fiction and essays have appeared in The New Republic, American Short Fiction, Gulf Coast, The Baffler, and elsewhere. He lives in Minneapolis. And I'll hand it over now. All right, well, thank you everybody for um, signing on and watching this. Um, I am gonna do just a little like short reading. I won't torment everybody for too long. <laughs> um, so I wrote this book um, and it's kind of about a lot of different things, um, mostly about the interaction with um, images and politics and the way uh, images have come to aggressively replace speech um, and replace the context that is inherent with speech or that comes with speech. Um, and I'm gonna read uh, from a little bit toward the end where I start to talk about kind of the, the role of the writer in American society. Um, so this is from the last part of the book. We need writers, Jennifer Egan wrote, for time at the end of 2018, and we need them badly. Literature, like democracy, is built of a plurality of ideas, she says. By writing and reading, we remind ourselves of the empathy, or the value of empathy, subtlety, and contradiction. It's an easy wish to understand that by the assumed virtue of writing, some truth is attained, an elemental and unignorable human compassion. I love Egan's work, but her portrayal of the writer in America is a fantasy. A writer, in reality, has the same duty to feel as superfluous and humiliated as anyone else caught in, the downward in this country's downward spiral of cultural and economic decline. Writers write, and if they're lucky, they publish in magazines and newspapers and books, an industrial model equally subject to the realities of American capitalism, that is, equally in decline. To put it another way, it is increasingly laughable to be called necessary in a culture with fewer and fewer places to even approach with ideas, much less hope to sell them. American culture, even American literary culture, does not revere its writers. With few exceptions, our writers are less the province of ideas or guidance than they are a container for aspiration. Expensive notebooks with pre-printed quotations in the margins, fountain pens, writing programs that cost tens of thousands of dollars, and books that are more enthusiastically Instagrammed, that is visually collected and displayed, than they are read or discussed. Photographs commit the present to the past and the idea of the writer in America has long been photographed, an impotently nostalgic romance. It's this romance writers now buy. Like so many other victims of capitalism, writers have been downgraded to a species of consumer. What is expected of us is merely our attention and participation, not our feedback and never our dissent. Our essays are personal, our novels are lyrical, the eye in our poems is the eye in our profile. Writers are commodities to be bought, hoarded or sold and usually on such a niche market that we're mostly buying, hoarding or selling each other. Clipped of politics and isolated on some pedestal of eternal truth or goodness or empathy, the romanticized, fetishized writer is a disarmed, declawed, defanged writer, 
little more than someone's rigorously trained pet. Is this the part where I talk? Sure. <laughs> um, so somewhere in, in um, I, I, I was reading and rereading, you say in the middle of one of these essays, you were never supposed to write this book. And I was curious about what was a turning point for you? Um, what was a turning point for me? I was thinking um, kind of the, 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 the very seductive idea of, my, my, my personal life isn't supposed to interfere with the value of uh, how my art is discussed. Mm -hmm. um, I found it, uh, I, I kind of early on bought into the very, um, the, the notion that to be taken seriously, you should not be mentioned as a gay writer, as a writer of you know erotic literary fiction or as a writer who um yeah kind of along those lines mm -hmm. and it really helped me to read sarah shulman's gentrification of the mind in particular but also some uh, other texts and other conversations that were happening around the same time uh, even Garth Greenwell's novel, What Belongs to You, um, to sort of see how that attitude was being used to convince me to marginalize myself in a mm -hmm. strange way. And that made me mad. Yeah, it's funny because I've been reading, um, I started to read Afro-pessimism um, and I'm blanking on the author. You'd think I know since I said I started reading it. Wilderson? Yeah. Um, I have the book, but I have not read it yet. Well, it's, it's the reason why I, I, I brought it up is that, um, and the reason why I'm not staring at the camera is that I'm actually secretly trying to forget his name quickly. Um, yeah, Wilderson, Frank, is that, uh, Reading, when you read Afro-pessimism, let me say this as bluntly as possible. I get suspicious of just about every damn white writer after reading that book. So it says something that what that what I've read of what I, you know, when I was reading your book and then rereading it after reading his book, that so much of it, there were actually some echoes. And I think one of it is, even though a lot of what you're talking about is imagery, but you're also talking a lot about intention. And it 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 it's it's one of the things we 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 um, don't talk about a lot, and I think it's it's all over the book. I mean, we can talk about it as well. Is how should we view or how suspicious we should be of say the intentions of white people? Yeah, um, I think Joe Osmondson said today that oh, I can't remember how he phrased it exactly that inherent to whiteness is the freedom to do harm mm -hmm. and you know there's a lot in the book about freedom from versus freedom to and so much of what is built into mm -hmm. the foundations of american you know political philosophy is prioritizing freedom to over freedom from mm -hmm. and i think that definitely kind of circles around the same place of you know what it what is the intention of um what is the intention of pushing one's own freedoms mm -hmm. and how, how does the, how does refusing to take in the harm that that causes uh, part mm -hmm. of that intent? It's funny. Soon as you started talking, I was saying to myself, but well, we weren't going to talk about Kanye West, but it's just, <laughs> because I think, because I think that's exactly when people say, Kanye is obsessed with white freedom or obsessed with whiteness. He is he, what he is obsessed with is the freedom to inflict, hmm. or, or also the freedom, the freedom to escape. And I think at some point he did fetishize that as a, as an ideal. It's one of the reasons why he will take very very reverential black black music and almost troll them. So he will take he will take um, strange fruit. 
mm. which nobody who's watching this talk needs to be told what it's about. Right. And sing about baby mama drama. Mm-hmm. You know, or take a gospel singer who he, he actually loves and talk about some sort of playboy pimp thing. Um, yeah. I don't spend too much um, talking, time talking about him. Um, but I, it made me think, actually, that didn't make me think, it's just the question I have next. There are some of these lines that I would love for you to talk some more about, like this one that um, we've been seeing things fascistly for decades. Yes, um, the idea that, uh, so I think my, my primary thought that comes to mind with that is the decades long transformation of politics into kind of the shared understanding that our civic decisions affect one another mm-hmm. into th- this massive entertainment complex that culminated and elected uh, an empty headed reality TV star as the president. Mm-hmm. That there's this idea that politics can be isolated from how it actually affects people and treated as though it is a game mm-hmm. or it is a spectacle, it is a, some sort of event. And we have been conditioned generally to disassociate the way that things are related. And that's sort of what I meant by uh, we've been seeing things fascistly is to dis- disassociate the way that, um, God, an example. Uh, well, I mean, to go back to the Kanye example, to disassociate mm-hmm. a song with incredible lyrics from its historical significance and just uh, steal the aesthetics from it and uh, cut that line and pretend that uh, you don't have to acknowledge the history behind it. Mm -hmm. Or um, to, you know, talk about um, racial disparity in education in major cities without talking about redlining, without talking about generational wealth. Mm -hmm. Um, This idea that, I mean, even, even um, was it today, the New York Times published this horrendous article about murder rates spiking. Oh, I saw that. And without talking about how, uh, you know, who the studies were coming from or the fact that um, overall violent crime is uh, on a, heading toward a, a you know, historic low. Mm-hmm. And just for the sake of, um, scaring people just for mm-hmm. the sake of promoting a pro-police uh, agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very much about selecting and filtering and presenting one version of what you want people to see. Mm-hmm. Speaking of seeing, because um, one of the things I... I, I it's funny, I have all these questions, but then I have all these lines that spark questions that um, sometimes mirror, you know, things that I've been thinking about. One of the things with lines that struck me in very different ways, and I, I love to talk about the, the different ways in which it struck me. When you write, but what would children have to look like in the next photographs? Right. You know, the, the next set of atrocities. It made me think of two things. It, it did one make me think of how we simply cannot humanize atrocities unless it's done to a white person. Um, look at the, 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 like last week, the whole media exploded again over a missing white woman, uh-huh. even though brown women go missing all the time. Right. Um, um, so it made me, but it made me also wonder, and I don't know if this is something that people outside of America think of, but, the, the, there's this idea of um, a kind of a worry about overexposure to imagery or a worry about what we do with the, what's the, what's the sort of responsibility that goes to the freedom of seeing these images? And my question with that is, when were these images ever free? And that a lot of times the images we talk about are curated. Think about the images we saw of the Iraq war. Right. Where were the, um, the dead uh, American soldiers? Yeah, mm-hmm. that um, it's, 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 it, it made me wonder, 
um, also because things are curated the way in which we look at atrocity. Um, most people have heard of school shootings. Most people have never seen the photo of a, a kid of somebody shot in a school shooting. Right. So it made me wonder: is it is it um, along with the how what would what what children would look like in the next photos? Is it also a question of how we curate what people see? Oh, very much. I mean, the um, I think the Iraq War photographs are a really great example because I think there was a executive order uh, mm -hmm. that uh, forbade uh, journalists, or I, I don't know if forbade is the right word, but uh, I, I do know that there was an executive order, let's say aggressively suggesting uh, mm -hmm. that newspapers and television programs were not to show the bodies of American soldiers. Mm -hmm. That would be demoralizing. Um, I think the, the idea of curation, where am I going with this? I mean, it, yeah, it, 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 it's not just um, the exposure or the desensitization to photographs. It's also um, getting a sense of what a particular sort of violence is like because of the way that the photographs or the atrocities or the images are curated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do think it's curious that, you know, what do we see when there's another school shooting? Mm -hmm. uh, we generally see either a photograph of police tape outside of the school, mm -hmm. or we see uh, if the particular domestic terrorist does not shoot himself, we see his mug shot. Yeah. yeah. There... there I hear there, 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 there is a sense um, of maybe, and maybe I have this wrong, of a slight sort of suspicion now or skepticism about what photos are doing or supposed to do. And the, but I'm wondering why why is it because of the excessive curi excessive curation why we've never had this skepticism before? Oh, I mean, I think the skepticism has been around, you know, for quite a long time. I mean, Sontag's on photography came out in 1977. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Benjamin wrote about photography in the 30s, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more so, and even um, there was a great exhibition in the 80s called The Indelible Image about war photography. Um, which Gary Indiana wrote about for the Village Voice and definitely questioned this almost anesthetic uh, overindulgence of juxtaposing all these images of war together that begins mm -hmm. to look like um, more so the photographer's glee rather than, um, you know, reporting on war. And I think... I think the distrust that is starting to kind of creep more so into the general consciousness is to do with the photographer is no longer quite the privileged position that it once was. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is armed with this device that can record and project and share and upload. Um, I also think the consciousness around manipulated photographs is also starting to kind of destabilize the authority of the photograph. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the authority of the photograph. Is it destabilized or is it, because sometimes destabilize implies that only one person was stabilizing it mm. or one body was stabilizing it. Um, so we have a conviction for, for the officer who murdered George Floyd, which also wouldn't have happened without citizen video. Right. Yeah, and I, you know, who's the authority there is that, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah, and the authority of war photography, the Robert Capa photo that was famously staged in the Spanish Civil War photograph of the soldier fall, mm -hmm. you know, amid, um, yeah, I, I mean, destabilize is definitely uh, not quite the right term. It's more um, questioned, mm -hmm. I suppose. Did Speaking of questions, did you find any of your 
stand, not, I don't use the word stance, but even the way in which you were interrogating a subject change as you were writing about the subject? I did, because mm -hmm. I remember thinking this, but now I'm having a lot of difficulty remembering it now. <laughs> um, Yeah, I think um, I think the thing that actually surprised me. So there's um, a section in the book after I talk about you know politics through images, and then images images as language, and then start to get kind of back into the political spectrum, and then talk about uh, kind of the erotic. The, in the Greek, you know, theory sense, the erotic uh, circuit of art, and how part of what draws us to things that we really like, or things that we really enjoy, or things that feel like they give our lives meaning, is a, a dark spot that we don't actually see. It's a kind of like a gravity that pulls us toward it. And as I was writing this section, all of the things that I was thinking about about fascism was that it's 100% aesthetic, it's um, mm -hmm. all about images and one dimensionality and it's all about seeing everything that you can see and et cetera, et cetera. Then I realized part of what makes a political movement like fascism super dangerous is that it does have a dark spot at the middle that pulls people toward it and they don't really understand what they're getting out of it, but they feel invigorated by participating in this mm -hmm. um, ecstasy, essentially. Mm -hmm. That, um, as I was writing it, I was like, oh, fascism is a kind of art. And I was kind of disgusted with my um, <laughs> conclusion, but I think um, it actually helped me justify my inclusion of the section on art mm -hmm. um, as a kind of pointing out you know, it is very important to demystify a lot of what we're looking at, but mm -hmm. I also want to respect the impulse toward mystification. Yeah, I, you know, the very first, I'm looking back, not at questions, what notes I wrote down when I, when I was just reading and just notes I was making in the margins of the book. Um, what I had, you know, ties into that, that um, fascism has always been interested in aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, sometimes it's sometimes <clears throat> aesthetics first. Yeah, I mean, even even uh, the very authoritarian kind of uh, military city states of Greece mm -hmm. are very much about how do we look, uh, how do our soldiers appear, how are we seen, how are we perceived, mm -hmm. um, and then you know the the very your fascist movement of. Nazi Germany, and there's a great um, Goebbels quote where, um, no, not Goebbels, it was Benjamin writing about Goebbels. Goebbels said something else. Mm -hmm. yeah, my wires crossed, but fascism gave the people not their political right, but their right to express themselves. Mm -hmm. And that particularly, um, stuck with me in terms of the way that our participation in politics is often subverted by um, making it about appearing to be participating in politics, mm -hmm. such as, you know, retweeting a, a news story or retweeting an opinion from somebody who, you know, hates the president or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, any, any kind of um, strongman movement or um extremely authoritarian culture generally propagates itself through images through imagery mm -hmm. i was wondering if if that's one of the ways in which fascism has always been able to deceive and eventually destroy some of the people who it lures to do this image making and by that i mean queers queers and freaks and artists and so on, that um, aesthetics don't just happen. Right. Um, Goebbels didn't sit down and paint a picture. No. 
um, you know, for every girl, there's an Albert Speer right. and there's a Lenny Riefenstahl. Um, I'm, neither of those fall within the realm of queer, mind you. Um, but there, I, I was wondering if, if, if that's one of the reasons how we get sucked into um, things like fascism, that there is that it, there is a sort of a, an aesthetic appeal as it, it goes to first. And it's sort of the, it's almost a granting of aesthetic freedom where mm -hmm. you, you're, you're seduced by the, by the idea that the most important thing is your creation of beauty. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what is valued most by this regime. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought of RuPaul. Um, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, All right, Ru, we love you. Yeah, no, don't. Yeah, don't, don't. don't <laughs> um, don't but see, you know what? I, I actually, I'm going to use as a slight segue. Okay, can we talk about that ridiculous Esquire story? Oh, the um, the the, the, the um, the portrait of the American man, I, and you know, it's American March, boy. March of 2019, yeah. Yeah, and I remember because Esquire was trying to get me to write for them, and I even wrote an article, a, a fashion article for them. And after seeing that, I was like, "There's just no way." Yeah. Um, we, for people that, who uh, haven't read the book and haven't read and probably don't know what we're talking about, you can give us a preface about that, that, that story. Yeah. So in, um, Black History Month of 2019, um, Esquire magazine published as its cover story for the March issue, but which appeared mm -hmm. you know, in February, um, portrait of an American boy at 17, uh, which was a kind of personality profile of this teenager in Wisconsin who was um, anti-choice, uh, kind of leaning pro-Trump, didn't understand why um, straight white men were suddenly the bad guy. Uh, and it was a very... Um, mm -hmm. Also didn't keep, can't understand why girls suddenly had a problem with them. Yes, that too. And mm -hmm. was written in a very objective way in terms of here's what he feels and here's what he thinks and here's where he goes to school. And, you know, there was no, there, there's only, I think, one political claim in the entire piece where uh, the author clarifies something about um, how one of the one of the people he looks up to is superbly homophobic or something like that, um, but otherwise nothing about you know abortion, nothing about um, how these political beliefs affect people in his community, um, no, nothing that you know. So that's the first like part of it. Mm -hmm. The second part of it is that it's written in a way as though he's some sort of exotic subject as though um, nobody knows what it's like to be a 17 year old straight white boy in the Midwest, even though our entire American culture is built around him as like the established neutral. Um, everybody in America knows what it's like to be a straight white boy in middle America, because that is where our entertainment is centered. That is where our stories come from. That is the whole mythos of American life is centered around someone like him. Mm -hmm. And he does not know what it's like for anybody else. And to present him as though he's some sort of unusual subject is disingenuous and um, even though it appears to be neutral is actually staking a claim that you know, we should support the people who are already in power. I thought, I agree with all that. One of the things I thought, funny enough, you said two words, and I actually think they're slightly opposed to each other, neutral and objective. Right. And I think one of the things that arose, particularly after the Trump, in the Trump administration, were all this journalism, Maggie Haberman at New York Times is one of them, who um, did all these reports which they claim were objective when they're really neutral. And it got to a point where I had to explain this in my nonfiction class. I said, listen, if the Jewish resistance and a bunch of Nazis clash in the forest and you say Jewish resistance and Nazis, um, you know, clash or, or that's 
you could claim objectivity. Mm -hmm. But if you go melee in the forest, right, that's neutral. Right. And one of those is responsible and one of those is not. Right. And it's when I read that article, I kept waiting for, if not irony, then interrogation. Right. And you say that in the book, the character subject is never interrogated. Yeah, and that, that it is a it is a very and it is a parallel to uh, journalistic phenomena of late too. You know, especially Haberman um, mm -hmm. trading uh, access for um, yeah total neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to frame anything. We're not going to put on the pressure. We're not going to uh, clarify anything. And I actually thought it was both exhilarating and intensely frustrating when on the afternoon, probably around two o'clock, 2.30 of January 6th of this year to see the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, all these major, you know, the liberal media, mm -hmm. um, suddenly start saying things like comma which is false uh, mm -hmm. or the president has just incited violence and like the president has been inciting violence for four years mm -hmm. um, but to suddenly see them when they knew that he was no longer in any way in power or defensible mm -hmm. to see them suddenly start pulling back from neutrality and clarifying with these more objective details mm -hmm. um, and just kind of illuminating the, the politics of neutrality. Mm -hmm. Well, who is this, who is this, um, who do you think this neutral, this neutral stance is for? Well, white supremacy by far. <laughs> I, mean, I mean- It sure is that ain't for me. Yeah. You know, I was uh, thinking, um, that what people don't seem to understand is that my choices are to be killed by the police with state support or to be killed by the police without state support. Right. Those are my choices. That's, it hasn't gotten better yet. Those are, that's what I'm still dealing with. Right. And um, that there, there is, it's, it's, it's weird coming from like a foreign country that has had, you know, that that was sort of chewed up and spat out by the Cold War, to see these the how little um, Americans are aware of these perspectives. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, Sontag appears a lot in the book, not a lot, but appears in some significant ways. And I'm pre yeah. and I can't imagine you not having a very mixed view of her. Yeah. And the stories. Um. She's one where I am extremely grateful mm -hmm. that I never actually met her. <laughs> um, she is much easier for me to like, mm -hmm. not, um, you know, cause you read about her, you read uh, how she treated people, mm -hmm. kind of grateful I missed out on all that. Um, and it's frustrating at times to see her, to know when she's digging her heels in mm -hmm. and just wishing that she, you know, would relent. Um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah. And also to go back and read her, you know, very early stuff and kind of see the, uh, you know, talk about intention to see the intent, but also to see the the paternalism in it, mm -hmm. especially when she wrote uh, "Trip to Hanoi." That that one's a that one's a giant mess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's um. I find that sometimes I I I can't get past the snobbery. Mm. And and, so, and and uh. My favorite is uh, Sigrid Nunez. Um, clarifying that she was not a snob, but she was an elitist. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, the dismissiveness, um, mm -hmm. 
the uh and she had yeah she had very uh unappealing and inequitable ideas about literature Mm -hmm. um i think what is her famous uh literature is not an equal opportunity employer Mm -hmm. yeah elitist i guess it's (laughs) um it's this is this was springing not just from the 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 esquire piece because the 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 piece right out of Piers is actually far bigger than that and talks about a lot of things quite frankly more consequential than that article um uh you know which also appeared at a time when print magazines are pretty down anyway uh, i'm not trying to kick a square when it's dumb but it did make me think about the role that cynicism plays in all of these things oh yeah yeah okay. um and it made me think of because one of the things that um it surprised me uh, that that one of the things that Esquire has said and lots of people have said it including the people behind that pretty insidious harper's letter last year oh my god i have the number of times i have done the whole what were you thinking yeah. but anyway um but the the this idea that there are there's this army of woke woke sort of fascistic anti-fascists yeah. trying to stifle expression and they're and narrowing their subjects and the one thing and i thought a lot of things but your book made me think of one thing in particular which is but your gaze was already narrow right so you're 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 a white man straight white man writing about straight white america having sex with straight white women in a town where there is nobody else and you think your vision is being narrowed your vision was a wide right yeah it's it's the i can't remember when the harper's letter happened um, um it didn't make it it in, was in the height of the black eyes matter demonstration so summer last summer last year it didn't make it into the book but um mm-hmm. it uh i find it I find this whole reactionary centrism thing mm-hmm. to be actually uh, I like that term so much I'm writing it down. <laughs> be deeply <laughs> fascinating. Um, it's it's almost as if there's an entire I, I think a lot of it in like Copernican metaphors, mm-hmm. an entire um, class of pundit that is now aware that the media or that culture, you know, culture at large no longer revolves around them. Mm -hmm. And that is so threatening to them that they have decided it is worth keeping alive a actual fascist political um, threat to have something to write about rather than risk becoming totally irrelevant uh, by having better people write about it in a much more ethical and clarifying fashion. One of the things that- about Anne Anne Applebaum in particular, she's she's Mm -hmm. one of the new uh, people that have joined the ranks where she's like, she said something the other day where she was like, I've written a lot about the right and it's still a very real threat, but why is no one talking about all these people who want to cancel us for our ideas like a yeah nobody's talking about that um <laughs> and it's it's amazing to see so many of these people who claim to be more concerned with the real problem on the right expending all of their energy publishing in magazines punching down mm-hmm. to people who they claim are oppressing them yeah it's amazing to me this the reaction is interesting which i will now use forever um, but the, the thing about it that which and it didn't surprise me that none of them could see it. And it's something that also comes up in your book when you talk about, you know, just how sometimes gentrifies liberalism is, is none of them could see the elitism of their stance. Right. That um canceling, and I have big problems with that term. I wish I had the power to cancel, <laughs> is always a problem when it's supposedly bottom up. But but a lot of people, including people who sign that letter, are perfectly fine when canceling comes from the top down. Right. 
So none of these people out there, none of these people out there are going to bat for Dixie Chicks. No. Nope. Also, some of the people who signed the letter have been blocking our professor's tenure for years. Right. No, I think of it in the same way that, um, you know, Citizens United has decided that uh, money is speech. Mm -hmm. And the same people who seem to be okay with that don't seem to be able to bear that fucking with your money is also speech. Mm -hmm. um, like if, it, if it's suddenly the prerogative to get somebody fired from a job or to withdraw a speaking engagement or to put financial pressure on them in some way, they mm -hmm. don't see that that is the same kind of speech as them paying a politician to mm -hmm. Legislate for something. Yeah, what I what I always found interesting, and I think it's something that particularly rose in the eighties, was this idea, this confusion between um, violating your or let's say messing with your freedom of expression and blocking your avenues for making money. Right. Like I'm not going to stop you from writing racist comedy. I'm not stopping you from doing it, but I will block you from appearing at this venue. Right. I'm not attacking your freedom of speech, but uh, which is protected. But I, I but but uh, but I can, I'll certainly block your avenues for making money. Right. Just and not. How much of this is a uh, really a problem of criticism, mm -hmm. and a lot of the people who are supposedly so concerned about free speech or free expression are unable to tolerate or refuse to tolerate the expression of criticism mm -hmm. and, or even- They're engaged. feminine if it's top down. Right. Mm -hmm. But- But it not, help you if you're a little, if you're a black teenage blogger. Right. No. Um, I'm curious about if, you, and this is something that even the, even the idea of it is, is, a, is, is a subject you talk about in, in your essays, but I'm curious in a book called Image Control, if there are actual images that actually stirred you to really think and write about what you're writing about. I do open with uh, the photo of the fence, um, mm -hmm. Matthew Shepard. Matthew Shepard, of course. Um, that one definitely came like to mind, a lot of it was actually Time Magazine covers. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there was that that one. There was the uh, Donald Trump one where he was styled to basically look like Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, there was the photograph of um, Dylan Harris and what's his name, Klebold. Klebold, um, mm -hmm. the Columbine shooters. Um, there were a lot of photographs that were coming out at the time um, of, you know, the devastation in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, those were among a lot of them. Kind of a lot of the, 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 a lot of the photographs that I discuss in the book are very much loaded toward the front of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just realizing this right now. And then I sort of get into how those are language and then how there's something deeper than language after that. Um, as far as any specific photographs, nothing that really comes to mind. Um, I think another thing that kind of was an overall phenomenon that really fueled the political interest in the book was around 2012, 2013, 2014, the seemingly sudden uh, flood of videos and images of, of police violence. Mm -hmm. um, it really seemed that right around that time, uh, if there was a murder of, uh, that the police had committed and if the person was black we were going to see it mm -hmm. um and it started to make me nervous is that the right word mm -hmm. i started to become kind of horrified by but also 
intrigued in the kind of ethical consequences of what does it mean to be sharing somebody's murder? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, the George Floyd is, uh, video is a really great example. Um, would he be convicted without the video? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, did we need to be sharing this video as though it was a viral meme? Um, that is, uh, to me, something that's incredibly disgusting, but it also uh, fueled the protests. Yeah, it's always tricky. It's um, Emmett Till's mother made the decision to show his, his you right. know, his face. Right. And uh, in the absence of that, I'm not saying the march to our civil rights wouldn't have happened, but I am saying it might have happened 10 years later. Right. Um, and I, and I, to, to, you know, it's one of the things I wrestle with, with images and with imagery is, are we in a situation where we're seeing, we have this paradox of seeing too much and not enough. Right. Like, I think uh, a black person beaten to death should be shown, but at the same time, are we just parading out the usual atrocities done to black bodies? Right. And also, what is the what is the context in which this image is shown? Part right. of what disturbs me about social media is that these videos of extreme, intense violence where you are literally seeing someone's last breath pass out of their body mm -hmm. appears in between um, somebody's joke about their job mm -hmm. and somebody saying that they're excited about a new book. Isn't that taking away of context, though, a very American way of viewing aesthetics? Oh, absolutely. And that right. goes back you know? to seeing fascistly for decades where... Right. Like, we, um, to, 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 to keep it up, like, to keep it at Emmett Till for a second, um, I forgot her name, that woman who did that painting of Emmett Till's face, where she rented it into the abstract. And it, it started the usual Heather, debates about free expression. Yeah. Heather's which is not what it was about. Heather, someone was the one who wrote the letter, right? Yeah. Is it Amanda, someone who was the artist? I think I, so. I should find I was just reading a, um, an article in Maggie Nelson that was talking about it. Oh, um, the, was it the An Andrew Long Chu piece? I don't know if she wrote it. If she had written it, I think it would have been way more cutting than it was. Yeah. Because I... You know, there Angela, were two like, you know, articles listen. about Maggie Nelson that came out on the same day. Was it the book forum yeah. one? That was the other one. No, uh, it was a book forum. I think it may have been New York Times. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah. Um, but what I was saying, the 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 what she didn't talk about this either. But one of the things that that um to bring back aesthetics is that it's literally what you were just saying that um, we can, even when we look at photos of atrocity, they're kind of amputated from context. Yes. And that one of the problems with that, and even the, 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 the installation scaffolding, which caused a huge shitstorm in Minneapolis a few years ago, um, is that we always see these atrocities done, but we never see or told who did, who did them. Right. I mean, and then I, people can say things. When people said to me, like, um, what happened to Emmett Till? It, it was a tragedy. I'm like, it's not a tragedy. There's a difference between a tragedy and an atrocity. Right. Losing your mom to cancer is a tragedy. Right. You know, a concentration yeah. camp is an atrocity. September 11th was not a tragedy. Yeah. It was, it was a, an atrocity. Right. And it was, but it was an event that had, that came out of politics and had political consequences. Mm hmm you know, it was not, but a, it's, it's, um, but you see, the thing is, it's, I don't know. I don't think Americans are in, I cannot think of what forum Americans would have where they get to view things that way. And, 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 we can, and you don't have to go as far or as wide as 9 11. We can go back to the, what opens your book, the Matthew Shepard story, which is way more complicated and messy. And you have to come to, quite frankly, a far more sophisticated opinion of the, of the thing. Than, right. what you, than what you might have, even if you watch the Laramie Project 10 times. Right. And which then raises a lot of other questions of why do we feel it's necessary to go out of our way to occlude 
details in order to merit sympathy. Mm -hmm. And I think simply that is sort of a, it's born out of and reinforces the problem that in America, it is incredibly hard to convince the public that you deserve sympathy or you have earned sympathy mm -hmm. or even that um, you did not deserve what happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, people have worked enormously hard about this for decades. Uh, every time a black man is murdered by police, mm -hmm. um, they immediately are like, well, what did he do? What could he have done differently? Mm -hmm. Um, it's the exact same register that's uh, surrounding uh, rape culture. Yeah. What did she wear? What did mm -hmm. she drink? Um, and yeah. the Matthew Shepard thing is interesting because they, so much of his life and who he was and what he was doing, which granted is nobody's fucking business, mm -hmm. but so much of it became pushed into the background so that it seemed like this, you know, innocent, virginal um, mm -hmm. gay boy was taken and murdered by two strangers at random. Yeah. And it's, you know, quite a bit more complicated than that. But without that complication, it's much easier to slap his face on a sign, put a slogan under it, and mm -hmm. extract some political result yeah all right i have really did not intend to hog the conversation but questions led to questions and um and i think you know there are some some quick q a questions which i want us to get into um and so that's uh, that's actually in the chat instead of the q a so then how can we explain crt to those who get so defensive um i don't think there's an explanation um because mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think the, the matter is that these people don't understand uh, critical race theory. Mm -hmm. um, the, it, it's, it's more so how do, you, how do you circumvent, eliminate, or neutralize the idea that uh, whiteness is threatened? Mm -hmm. And kind of my thought is, um, why is whiteness threatened? Um, it's because everybody in America is fucking desperate. Mm -hmm. um, and really like the CRT debate is just another uh, layer of um, the, the increasing confinement of agency brought about by total economic decline and despair that is basically the breeding ground for these incredibly racist ideas. Mm -hmm. It's interesting since most of America will never encounter critical race theory in the classroom. Or recognize it. You yeah. Know. And yeah. then again, these are the same people who yeah. are very much concerned with um, yeah. freedom of expression and freedom of ideas and the, the marketplace of ideas. That's one of my mm -hmm. favorite phrases. I, I, I found, um, it was a wonderful article. I can't remember who wrote it. It was a, it was a religion, it was a, it, it may have been a seminarian, but it was certainly uh, somebody religious or a priest talking about the biblical, the biblical basis for critical race theory. Um, no, he wasn't attacking, he was praising it. Yeah. And, his, and one of his points was, so can you give me the names of the Roman soldiers who pierced Jesus's side? You know, um, you know, what was it of what year was was what Caesar was reigning and what was the year of his reign and what colors were really pop popular at that time? I said no. So you 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 have a gospel that's that's absolutely victim centric. Right. Because if I were to write about the crucifixion now in a language that the right would approve of. Jesus would barely get mentioned. It would be right. terrorists executed. But how do you let my toga? 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so it's 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 just that that doesn't that the way in which we are creating these boogeymen. Um, I saw a question here that was in the chat. It says, so whom does culture revolve and why must it revolve around seemingly a single center? I mean, I mean, I think that the, that's why I kind of use the Copernican example of um, rather than everything revolving around a certain type of person, it's more so all the type of people revolving around for lack of a better word, uh, the political sphere, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically, uh, instead of one person being at the center and all the other uh, political bodies revolving around them, um, kind of the, the, the crisis is that person realizing that they're just another, um, focal point on the intersectional identity matrix mm -hmm. uh, revolving around everybody's shared experience. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe, maybe it's more like a flat earth or metaphor or something, I don't know. Um, but it's, uh, it's not as if, you know, with Copernicus, now, you know, we're getting really nerdy, but it's not as if with Copernicus, he simply said, uh, Earth is not the center of the universe, um, and Jupiter is, you know, and the sun revolves around Jupiter and we're here in the mess somewhere. It's a, a total reimagination of the entire solar system. And I think that's what, um, to go back to it as a, you know, political metaphor, that's, that's what people are finding, the people who were at the center are finding so um, threatening and destructive is because basically their privilege, their power, their supremacy is being um, questioned. Are we, what was it culture? Are we talking all culture or popular culture? Because there are times I wonder if sometimes these right wing or right wing ish people have a point um, that. Um, that in some ways the culture, if we say popular culture has kind of moved on without them or not moved on without them, but doesn't see any benefit in centering them anymore. Like if I were a right wing person say in the eighties, I could enjoy most pop music. Um, yeah. You know, um, I can ignore Bruce Springsteen lyrics because he's, it sounds so flag wavy. Right. I don't know who Madonna voted for. If I was into action films, almost every action film reflected my worldview. I mean, come on, Rambo. Yeah. Well, yeah, and so on. And is, if it's a, is it a situation where they felt culture was a thing that they were actively participating? Not, not, no, nobody's not participating, but catered to them in a way that it just doesn't right. know. Whereas, you know, look at Trump supporters and what culture they have left. Mm -hmm. um, they basically have a few racist musicians, uh, a couple fascist filmmakers, um, and a whole host of media clowns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the 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 the, the Starbucks thing I really love too. Um, we're gonna <laughs> Starbucks because you know you're famous for drinking at Starbucks, mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, I think I think um, pop culture is probably an important distinction. Mm -hmm. um, it's the culture. It's the culture that is reflected back at most people, all people, um, on an easily and ex an easy and accessible basis. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you turn on a random television station, if you turn on a random radio station. If, if you can figure out how to do that anymore. I don't, um, I still can't get NBC on my TV. I don't know how, <laughs> um, but you know, that, that, that's what I mean by culture is whatever's being reflected back at you at that time. Mm -hmm. Obviously um, the internet has very much made it clear how uh, subcultures are uh, a unique 
and terrifying thing sometimes, particularly in their uh, intersection with politics. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, would involve a whole host of new metaphors um, <laughs> involving lots of um, creepy little underground cells and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes. Um, I have no idea if we're out of time, but I'm seeing that it's after eight. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Um, ask them now, <laughs> or we're going to say goodbye. Yeah. All right. Well, huh? um, oh, hold on. oh, I'll come back and I'll say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Goodbye. Um, thank you so much for hosting us. This was a wonderful conversation, as always. Thank you, Marlon. Oh, absolutely. Always appreciate it. Always mm. enjoy uh, listening to you talk. Um, yeah, thank, yeah. Thanks thank so you. much. Thanks for reading. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks to both of you. Thank you to everybody who asked questions. Um, and if anybody missed any of that, uh, we, we will be on YouTube soon. And All right. Buy the book. Thank you. Yes, please buy the book. It looks like this. <laughs> Good, night. Good night. Good night, guys.